can you guys believe it? This is our last uh, Monday afternoon lecture in this lecture theatre for the year. Um, so it seems like we haven't had a lecture here for a while, right? I guess with all the uh, bank holidays. So very good to see everybody here for uh, one uh, last lecture in this uh, big old lecture theatre. Now, the subject for this week, we're going to be thinking about gravity. Now, who has studied some gravity before, maybe in some other courses? Who's done some bit of gravity before? Okay, so just a few people. Okay, now we have actually seen a few examples of gravity coming up throughout the year. You know, we've seen the force of gravity. We've been thinking about the acceleration due to gravity, but Today, we're going to be thinking about the physics of gravity. So sort of what's going on, what's causing that acceleration due to gravity, what's some of the energy involved with it. Um, so the plan for today, we're going to be thinking about work and um, energy in gravity. And next time on Friday, we're going to be thinking about gravity in the context of orbits. So that's the plan for what we're going to be thinking about for this uh, last week of the year. Now I'd like to start with this really beautiful picture over here. Has anybody seen um, a picture of something like this before? Have you seen a picture like this before? Okay, okay so where have you seen a picture like this before? Okay, okay, very good. So yeah, so what this is a picture of is it's actually a result from a cosmological simulation. So this is simulating the universe on the very largest scales. And it's actually a simulation, not of the regular kind of matter that we're all made out of. It's a simulation of what cosmologists call dark matter. So the invisible matter that we think makes up the majority of the mass in the universe. Now we can't directly see dark matter with a telescope, but if we're on a computer, we can put the dark matter in and we can simulate where it is. And it's the force of gravity which causes all of this absolutely beautiful structure to form. So we get what we call these filaments over here, and it forms this really beautiful cosmic web. And it really is a really beautiful simulation. And this eagle simulation here is one of the biggest ever cosmological simulations. So um, it kind of starts over here and you can see that the structure is just starting to form. And then as we get more and more recent, if we kind of move over to this side, we can see the structures starting to form and we're starting to get a bit more contrast there. And what's causing that structure to form, what's causing this contrast to form is the force of gravity. And it's exactly the force of gravity that we're going to be thinking about all this week. At each one of these points you can see here, that's not a star, that's potentially a whole other galaxy cluster. So we think, you know, our own Milky Way galaxy maybe lives in a cluster, something like this, and it could be one of those points there. So it really is a very kind of beautiful result that we get from this. And this week we're going to be thinking about some of the physics which is involved in gravity. Now, this is a kind of very latest, some of the latest ever research on gravity, but I think for a lot of people, the story of gravity um, actually starts uh, um, not too far away from where we are right now, actually. So it starts with this uh, tree over here. So who's heard the story here? Um, you know, we've got Newton, he's sitting under the tree, and then, you know, the story is the apple falls on his head, and that gives him the idea for gravity. So apparently this is the very tree that he was sitting under. Now, we're not 100% sure if the story happened exactly as he said, but of course the theory that Newton described with gravity, that is absolutely exact. And that's what we're gonna be thinking about in the lecture today. And what Newton discovered with gravity is what we call the universal law of gravity. And the key insight there is that the force of gravity that's causing that apple to fall off the tree and land on his head, it's the exact same force of gravity that is causing all of that beautiful cosmological large scale structure in that other picture. It's the same force. And that's really 
one of the most important and fundamental principles of physics that we can go out and look at the universe on the very largest scales and it's governed by the same forces and the same physics as on the surface of the earth and by studying the universe, universe in both those different regimes we can kind of learn about both of them and test, uh, test the universe in both of those scales. So that's the uh, kind of where the story of gravity starts and what Newton came up with was this universal law to describe the force of attraction between two bodies. So let's have a think about what Newton came up with, with this universal force law. So what Newton described is a force law that describes the force between two masses. Now, something that we know about gravity is that it's always attractive. It always brings things together, doesn't cause things to push apart, at least not on everyday scales. And we know that the force of gravity, it's directly proportionate to each mass. So if we double each mass, we're gonna get double the force of gravity. And then one of the key things that Newton realized is that the force of gravity, it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So if we double the distance between two masses, we're gonna get a quarter of the force. So these are some key points to be thinking about when making a law of gravity. So have a look at these options here and have a think about which one of these options is going to describe all of these um, observational relationships that we can see here. If you'd like a bit of a hint with this one, remember we've actually seen a force law of exactly the same form when we were thinking about Coulomb's law. So Coulomb's law has exactly the same relationship except instead of masses it was the electrical charges. So if you're not sure about this one, maybe have a think about the force law that we saw in Coulomb's law and see if you can do a bit of a comparison, see if that's going to help you identify which one of these is the correct force law. All right, very good to see those responses coming in. Let's take a look, let's see what everybody thinks, which one of these is our correct force law for gravity. Okay, all right, fantastic. 100%. Okay, so very well done everybody with this one. Correct answer is of course option B. Okay, so that's great to see everybody getting that one. I think that's a uh, very good start for the lecture. Now if you're writing this stuff all down in your notes, definitely put a big old box around this equation. Really super important equation whenever we are thinking about the force of gravity. And what this tells us is if we have two masses, now this could be maybe a planet and a moon, so maybe that's the mass of our planet, that's the mass of our moon, could be a planet and a star, could be a satellite. So we've got the masses and we know the distance between them. We can then calculate the force of gravity, the attractive force between them. And then this capital G here, that's Newton's gravitational constant. So this is just some numerical value which sets the scale for the force. So very well done everybody for that question. That's a great start to the lecture. Now that's what our, um, the equation for our force looks like. Let's have a think about what this looks like when we're trying to sketch this. So I've got four potential graphs here. I'll just move this code out the way in a minute. Um, and we've got distance on the horizontal axis, force on the vertical axis. So have a think, which of these four sketches is a graph of that force law where the force is inversely proportional to R squared? If you're not sure about this one, a good tip whenever we're thinking about trying to find curves is think about what's going to happen for really small values of R and really large values of R. So maybe think about what's going to happen to that force as R goes to zero and think about what's going to happen to this force as R goes to infinity or goes to really big numbers. Think about what's going to happen to the force and maybe from those four graphs there you can spot which one is going on there or maybe you can um, eliminate some if they're not got all the right features. All right, very good to see those responses coming in. Let's have a look which one of these is our graph of the force. Okay, so nobody's going for option B. Some people need to be A or C. Looks like most people are going for option D. So let's have a look what have we got here. B, C, or D. Okay, so if we have a look at this force here, so GMM over R squared, so as R gets bigger, 
the force is going to get smaller. So we know it can't be option B, it's no one meant for, and also we can use that to eliminate option A, because even though it's the kind of right sort of curvy shape, um, as we are getting bigger, the force is actually increasing. So we know it can't be that one. Now, option C, this does decrease as we go to bigger R. So I can see why you might be thinking it's this one. But let's have a look at what happens as we come to smaller and smaller r. It looks like it just kind of converges to a value. But if we look at the force there, it's something divided by r. So if we divide by a very, very small number, that force is going to get much, much bigger. So it's actually going to shoot up there. So the graph that's got all these pieces is graph D over here. So correct answer is option D. So very well done, everybody, with that question, spotting that it's option D. So this is the kind of classic inverse squared. So it's a sort of graph of something versus one over R squared. Now thinking about the form of the graph is really useful whenever we're thinking about doing work uh, involving gravity and anything involving um, energy and gravity. Because remember work, it's an integral of force over distance. So let's have a look at how this works in a bit more detail. So this is our correct graph of force versus distance. So maybe we've got our two masses over here. So over on that side, you know, we've got some mass that could be the mass of the Earth, maybe. And then over here, maybe, you know, we've got some other mass could be the mass of a you know, spacecraft or an asteroid or something like that. And there's some attractive force between these two masses. And then this is what the force is as it varies with distance. Now, suppose we've got our mass sitting over there and then it's gonna fall in towards that big mass over there. So it's gonna to fall to some distance, some particular value of the distance, we'll call that capital R. Now we know that some work has been done here because we've got some force and we've got some distance. So we know some work has been involved, but our force isn't constant. So we can't just work out what the work is by, you know, multiplying a force by a distance. So does anyone have any thoughts? How can we actually calculate what the amount of work done uh, in this situation is? Any thoughts on that? So fundamentally, we're still multiplying a force by a distance, but the force is always changing. So what we have to do is we have to work out the integral. So in other words, we have to work out the area between this curve all the way up to the particular distance that the, um, the mass has moved to. So it's really this um, shaded area of the graph over here. So the area of this graph, that's gonna tell us how much work we've done in moving this mass around. And if you've done a bit of calculus before, that's just the integral of this graph. So in this next question, let's have a think about how we actually go about working this out. So remember, we're just trying to calculate what this area under the curve is. So we know that work, it's always the integral of force times distance. Force, in this case, so g mm over r squared. So that's the force that we're integrating with respect to distance. And just as a reminder, we've got this form for a standard integral. So whenever we have the integral of x to some power, we always know the integral is going to be um, x to that power plus 1 divided by n plus 1. So have a think about those pieces of the puzzle. Have a think carefully about what n is. See if you can work out this integral. See if you can calculate which of these options is the work done whenever we are moving a mass over some distance. If you've done some calculus before, if you're feeling confident with integrals, you can probably recognize this as a pretty standard, pretty straightforward integral. If you haven't seen integrals before, if you're not so confident with integrals, we're just calculating the area and you can just go right ahead and use that equation for the standard integral. So we know if we have an integral of the form x to the n, we know what the integral is. So really what this question is about is identifying what is that little n and then applying it in that standard integral there. All right, then let's take a look at the responses. Which one of these is the amount of work we've done when we're moving something against the force of gravity? Let's have a look. Okay, so 
Uh, looks like we've got some people thinking could be all of them. Looks like most people go for option C. Now, the tricky thing with this question, so we've got GMM divided by R squared. But if we look at this standard integral form here, we've got, you know, x to the n uh, dx is equal to, you know, uh, we've got x to the n plus 1. So we've got to really think about what does the n correspond to in that equation. Now, you might think, OK, well, it's, it's R squared, so n has got to be 2. But remember, we're dividing by R squared. So that's the same as multiplying by r to the minus 2. So really our n is actually minus 2. So what we want to do is apply this standard integral when n is equal to minus 2. So minus 2 plus 1 is minus 1. So we're going to get um, divided by minus 1 and we're going to get r to the minus 1. So if we have a look at these options here. So they've all got the minus sign in front and we're really looking for the one which is divided by r. So when we have a look at that, so 3, 2, 3. So it's got to be option C over here. So that's what we get when we uh, work out the uh, integral over here. So very well done everybody with this question, especially if you got that the correct answer is option C. Now again, another very important equation. Definitely put a big old box around this one if you're following along in your notes, because this tells us how much work is involved if we have something moving against gravity. Now, if you have a look in the textbook or you're reading up online, you might or you might not see this equation written down with the minus sign. So it really should be written down with the minus sign, but sometimes you might not. So you've just got to think, okay, are we having to come in and do the work against gravity or is gravity doing the work. That's just going to let us know if that um, sign is going to be there, okay? Um, so just think, you know, if, you're, if you want to lift something up, obviously we have to come and do the work. If something's falling down, then, you know, gravity is doing the work of putting something in there. So just watch out for what's going on with the uh, sign there. Now, does anybody recognize this? Where have we seen this kind of situation before? Coulomb's law, exactly right. So it's exactly the same situation as going on with Coulomb's law. In fact, exactly the same uh, kind of situation around because they're both inverse square laws. So we do the same kind of integral. The difference is here that we've got the masses, whereas in Coulomb's law, we've got the charges. But otherwise, everything's the same. So what I'd like to think about now, so we know this is the amount of work involved if we want to move something against gravity. So let's take a look. Let's see the implications for what this means in practice. So what I've got over here, so we've got a graph of distance against potential energy. And you can think about this gravitational potential energy. This is really the amount of work you need to do to move something from where it is to um, escape the pull of gravity. And we're thinking over here, maybe we've got a situation, we've got the planet Earth, and we've got an apple, maybe it's just fallen off the tree and hit Newton on his head over there. So we've got planet Earth and we've got the apple. So let's have a think about what our potential energy is against distance. So you might want to try sketching this in your notes. So remember that it's negative, so it's minus something over R. So what this looks like is actually this curve here. So this is minus something over r and it also depends on you know g and those masses and if we have a look at the apple the apple sitting on the surface of the earth so you might think well does that mean that our distance is zero but what really matters for all of these calculations is our distance from the center of mass so our distance isn't zero it's actually the distance of the radius of the earth so right now all of us we are a distance of the radius of the Earth from the center of mass of the Earth. So whenever we're thinking about any calculations going on with gravity for us on the surface of the Earth, we need to be thinking about the radius of the Earth. So let's have a look at how much potential energy our apple has when it's sitting on the surface. So it's actually got what we say negative potential energy. So what this means is if we want to release the apple from the gravitational pull of the Earth, send that apple off into space, we need to give it a certain amount of energy 
so we can release it from this, as we say, a gravitational potential well. So if we have a look at how much energy this apple has, we know that it's kind of uh, it's got this much sort of energy deficit. So all of us, all of us now, you know, we're attracted by the gravity of the Earth onto the surface. We don't just float off into space. If we want to float off into space and keep going and never come back, somehow we need to get this much energy to overcome that energy that we have, the um, gravitational potential energy that we have sitting on the surface of the Earth. Does anyone have any thoughts what form of energy that's going to come from? What form of energy is that going to be? So it's, oh uh, yeah, the bag. Kinetic energy, absolutely right, okay? So it's really pretty straightforward. Um, you know, if we think about, you know, got a pen or something, if we throw it up, uh, not very fast, goes up and then it comes straight back down. So we're giving it a little bit of kinetic energy and then that gets converted to gravitational potential energy and then back down to kinetic energy. Now, if you could throw the pen really, really fast, it would just go straight up and I guess through the ceiling and just keep on going and never come back down. And that's if you throw it with exactly this much um, kinetic energy. So we want the kinetic energy to equal the potential energy that we have on the surface here. So our kinetic energy has got to equal to this. So if you're launching a space rocket and you don't want your satellite to ever come back down to Earth, you don't want your satellite to just orbit the Earth, you want to send your satellite way out into deep space, never come back to Earth, you need to have a huge amount of kinetic energy equal to the gravitational potential energy that we have on the surface. So let's have a think about this. We can send our apple flying off into space if we throw it really fast. How fast do we have to be throwing this apple so that it's never going to come back? So we've got a few options here. So remember that right now, sitting on the surface of the Earth, our gravitational potential energy, it's gmm over r. So the result that you guys just worked out from the integral. And we know for escape velocity to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth, that's what our kinetic energy has to equal. So see what you get when you set these equal to each other and solve for the velocity. That's going to give us what we call our escape velocity. If you're not sure about this question, we're really just doing a bit of algebra because we know at escape velocity, our gravitational potential energy, that u there, that's going to be equal to our kinetic energy. So set them equal to each other. See what you get when you solve for v. That's going to tell us how fast we need to go in order to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. All right, then. Good to see those responses coming in. Let's take a look. What does everybody think? How fast do we need to go? OK, so I'm going for B and D. Looks like most people are thinking that it's option A. So that's exactly right. When we set these two equal to each other and solve for V, what we get is option uh, A over here. So that's our escape velocity. How fast we need to go to give something enough kinetic energy that it can escape the gravitational pull of a planet, keep on going and never come back. So we can see it depends on the mass of the object and the exact radius that we are from the center. So how big something is and how heavy something is. Now we can calculate what these values are, uh, you know, for Earth or, you know, for any planet we like. Here's a question though. What would happen if the escape velocity for something was equal to the speed of light? What, what do we call that? What's going on then if the escape velocity is equal to the speed of light? Exactly, it's a black hole, you can't escape from it. So that's exactly what's going on with a black hole. So as we make something heavier and heavier and denser and denser, this escape velocity is going to get faster and faster. And eventually that escape velocity is going to get so high it's equal to the speed of light. So even if you could launch your apple up at the speed of light, it wouldn't ever be able to, um, uh, to escape. So 
with this equation, this is actually quite a sort of straightforward thing to um, calculate now. So we can actually just say, well, what if our escape velocity is equal to the speed of light? How small would something have to be? So let's give this a go in this question. We know what our escape velocity is, so square root of 2gm over r. So let's have a think. Suppose we set our escape velocity equal to the speed of light. What do we get when we solve for the radius? If you're not sure about this question, remember we're just setting the velocity equal to the speed of light and then rearranging that equation to solve for the radius. So just a bit of algebra with this question. Now you might think, well hang on, if we're thinking about black holes, don't we really need general relativity and work out the full math involved there? But amazingly, this is one situation where we can work out this result with what we call Newtonian gravity, so force is equal to that inverse square law, and we actually get exactly the same result as if we'd worked it out using general relativity. So it's quite a fun thing to try, not too tricky algebra, see what you get for the uh, Schwarzschild radius. So the radius, something has to be to be crushed down into a black hole. All right, let's take a look. What do we get for this result here? Okay, so looks like most people going for option C. So when we set our escape velocity equal to the speed of light and then rearrange again, solve for the radius, what we get is option C over here. So very well done everybody who gave this question a go, especially if you got that this is the, um, the result. So how small something would have to be compressed in order to become a black hole. So if we know how heavy something is, how much mass it has, we know how small we have to squash it in order for it to turn into a black hole. And as I mentioned, this is a really amazing result because to work out this um, value in full, you actually have to study what we call general relativity. So if you're studying physics, you might study that towards the end of your degree. But the result actually comes out exactly the same if we just do this quick calculation here. And it gives us uh, this scale for how small something has to be in order to be crushed down into a black hole. Let's try some numerical examples now, thinking about the planet Earth in particular. So for the planet Earth, we know how heavy planet Earth is. So let's have a think, how small would we have to crush planet Earth down to in order for the whole planet to be squashed to become a black hole? We're just trying numerical example with this. So we know that the radius r is equal to 2 gm over c squared. We know the mass of the Earth. We know g, that's Newton's gravitational constant. And we know the speed of light. So c is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So see what you get when you crunch the numbers. How small do we have to make planet Earth in order for the whole planet to be squashed down to a black hole? All right, then let's take a look. How small do we have to crush planet Earth for it to become a black hole? Let's have a look. Okay, so nobody's going for C. We've got a kind of range of numbers there. So maybe just check your math when you put the numbers in, when you work things through, because when you put all the values in, uh, what we actually get is this 8.85 millimeters over here. So very well done, everybody who gave this question a go, especially if you got that the correct answer is option D over here. Now that's pretty small, right? So I guess about the size of like a grape. So if you imagine taking the entire planet Earth, everything on the whole planet, squashing it right down to the size of a grape, you're gonna have a black hole on there. So the escape velocity, it's gonna be the speed of light. You'll never be able to escape from there. We're gonna have a black hole. Now I thought that's quite a kind of dramatic sort of situation. So I thought for the last question today, let's have a think about just the escape velocity of regular Earth as it is. Okay, so let's not worry about crushing Earth down to a black hole. Let's just think about Earth at its current everyday radius. Um, how fast do we have to go in order to escape the surface of the Earth? We have all the ingredients we need for this question here. So we've got our velocity, square root of 2 gm over r. We know g, Newton's gravitational constant, we know the mass of the Earth, and we know 
the radius of the Earth. So see what you get when you run through this calculation. What's the escape velocity of the Earth? How fast do we have to launch a rocket so that it's going to launch a satellite or something like that and it's going to escape the Earth and have enough energy that it never comes back? All right, very good to see those responses coming in. Let's take a look at this. How fast do we have to launch a spaceship so that it can escape the uh, gravitational pull of the Earth? Okay, so no one going for B and C. Looks like most people going for option D. So when we substitute these values in, calculate what we get for the escape velocity, what we get is option D over here. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go, especially if you got this escape velocity. So 11.2 kilometers per second. So really an extraordinarily fast speed. So if you imagine how far away something is, you know, 11 kilometers um, from here, imagine traveling that distance in one second. That's how fast you have to go in order to reach escape velocity. So if you're on planet Earth and you want to travel off into the stars, that's how fast you're going to have to launch your rocket. But amazingly, if you do, you're going to have so much energy that you're going to keep on going and you're never going to fall back to Earth, even though that um, force of gravity, it does extend out that far. Now, this is a really interesting result because if we're thinking about launching rockets and getting escape velocity, we know how fast we need to go. But very often when we're launching a space rocket, we don't want to send it out into the stars, we just want to send it into orbit around the Earth. And the physics of orbits is actually a bit more interesting and involves a lot of the concepts we've been thinking about over the past couple of weeks, especially about circular motion. So um, that's the plan for next time we're going to be thinking about orbits. So just a couple of quick reminders before everybody wraps up. Just remember, we've got the workshops tomorrow afternoon. That's going to be a bit more of a kind of um, exam preparation session. I'm not going to be talking for the whole time, but just have a few slides at the beginning with some info about the exam. And then, of course, we've got our last ever lecture on Friday. We're over in Congregation Hall, so just check the exact location. We're going to be going over orbits. Uh, but that's it for today. So excellent work with all these questions, everybody. Hope you guys have a great week and I'll see you all tomorrow afternoon.